Greetings, fellow surfers of airwaves. Today we dive into a fascinating tidbit from the annals of radio history, featuring none other than Boris Karloff, a legend of the horror film genre. Most renowned for his chilling portrayal of Frankenstein's monster, Karloff also left an indelible mark on the stage and airwaves with his role in the dark comedy Arsenic and Old Lace. Originally a hit on Broadway where Karloff played the sinister but comical role of Jonathan Brewster, the play included a delightful twist. Characters in the play often remarked that Jonathan bore a striking resemblance to Boris Karloff, a humorous nod to the actor's iconic status and distinctive features. This meta-joke became a cherished part of the production, adding a layer of insider humor for the audience. However, when Arsenic and Old Lace was adapted into a film in 1944, Karloff was notably absent from the cast. He was still captivating audiences on Broadway. The producers chose not to replace him in the stage production during the film's release. But Karloff's connection to Jonathan Brewster did not end there. In 1946, the Screen Guild Theater brought Arsenic and Old Lace to radio, and Boris Karloff reprised his role, this time reaching an even broader audience through the airwaves. This performance allowed listeners to experience Karloff in the very role that cheekily referenced his film career, a role that filmgoers missed seeing him play. This unique layer of theatrical irony and Karloff's involvement brought a rich, self-referential humor to the broadcast, bridging his work across stage, screen, and radio, and underscoring his versatility as an actor far beyond the confines of the horror genre. Without further ado, we present Mr. Boris Karloff. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, Lady Esther has the pleasure of bringing you one of the famous hits of our generation, Joseph Kesselring's Arsenic and Old Lace, originally produced on Broadway by Russell Krauss and Howard Lindsay. It stars Boris Karloff from the original cast and one of Hollywood's most popular young actors, Eddie Albert. And here they are, appearing with the Lady Esther Screen Guild players in Arsenic and Old Lace. <laughs> You could ask anybody in that section of Brooklyn, and they all would tell you the very same thing. The neighbors, the minister, Dr. Harper, even O'Hara, the cop on the beat. You mean them two old Brewster sisters? Why, there ain't two sweeter little ladies in the world. Too bad, though, about that nephew of theirs. Too bad, he sort of... Charge! Charge! Follow me, men! Up San Juan Hill after Teddy Roosevelt! See what I mean? But the Brewster sisters have another nephew, Mortimer. He's dramatic critic on a New York paper. And he's always considered himself quite sane until tonight. And Evie, Aunt Martha, I have news for you. I'm going to marry Elaine Harper. Oh, Mortimer, how nice. Our minister's daughter. Really, Mortimer? We ought to celebrate. Not tonight, darlings. I've got to pick up Elaine and get back to town. Have to cover a play tonight. Well, I do hope it's something you like for once. What's the name of it, dear? Murder Will Out. I'll bet I can write the review without even seeing it. I always said you were talented, dear. Same old tripe. When the curtain goes up, first thing you see is a dead body. Well, maybe you won't actually see it. It'll be hidden somewhere, like in this window seat. Then someone will come on, walk in sort of casually, lift the cover up of the window seat like this. And... Why, Mortimer, dear, what's the matter? Aunt Abby, Aunt Martha, there's a d d dead man in there. <laughs> Now, look, aunties, let me say it again slowly. There's a body in the window seat. Yes, dear, we know. You know? <laughs> well, of course. Oh, honestly, I never thought Teddy would ever get... Listen, you were planning to send him to that, that sanitarium, Happy Dale? Yes, dear, it's all arranged. Elaine's father brought the papers over this afternoon. Here they are, all ready for Teddy to sign. Well, he's got to sign them right away. Tonight! If they ever found out he's killed a man, they'll... Oh, Teddy didn't do that. He did He didn't? Now, Mortimer, just forget about it. Forget you even saw the gentleman. Forget? We never dreamed you'd peek. But, uh... <laughs> but 
Then who is he? His name is Hoskins. Adam Hoskins. That's all I really know about him. Except that he's a Methodist. Yes, but... What, what's he doing here? What happened to him? He died. Aunt Martha, men don't just get into window seats and die. No, Mortimer. He died first. Well, how? Oh, Mortimer, don't be so inquisitive. The gentleman died because he drank some wine with poison in it. Elderberry wine. How did the poison get in the wine? Oh, we put it in the wine because it's less noticeable. When it's in tea, it has a distinct odor. You put it in the wine? Yes, and we put Mr. Hoskins in the window seat because Elaine's father was coming to tea. Then you knew what you'd done. You didn't want Dr. Harper to see the body. Well, not at tea. That wouldn't have been very nice. <laughs> Now, Mortimer, dear, you, you can forget all about it. Teddy's down in Panama right now. Panama? You know, the cellar. He always calls the cellar Panama. And the steps over there are San Juan Hill. He's down in Panama now, digging the lock. You mean you're going to bury Mr. Hoskins in the cellar? Of course, dear. That's what we did with the others. Well, I don't think you should... Others? The other gentlemen. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Let me get this straight. When you say others, do you mean others? More than one? Uh, others? Oh. Yes, sir. Uh, this is 11, isn't it, Abby? No, dear. This makes 12. <laughs> well, you, you really shouldn't count the first one. After all, he just died. Just died? Well, Martha means without any help from us. Mr. Midgley was his name. He was a Baptist. And he came here looking for a room. It was right after you moved to New York, Mortimer. It didn't seem right to leave that lovely room empty with so many people needing it, so we advertised that Mr. Midgley applied. He was so lonely, no kith or kin. We felt so sorry for him. And then when his heart attack came and he sat there dead in that chair. Remember, Martha? It was just like old times. Yes. Grandfather was a doctor, you know. He always had a cadaver or two around the house. <laughs> Only Teddy insisted that Mr. Midgley was a yellow fever victim and had to be buried at once. So we buried him in Panama. Yes. Yeah. Mm. He looked so peaceful, didn't he, Abby? Oh, so serene. And we made up our minds right then and there that if we could help other lonely old men find the same peace, we would. So that's, that's how it all started, that man walking in and dropping dead. Oh, well, of course, we realized we couldn't depend on that Mortimer. always happening. Mortimer, so, uh, you know those jars of poison that have been up in Grandfather's laboratory all these years? And your Aunt Martha has such a knack for mixing things. <laughs> well, dear, for a gallon of elderberry wine, I take one teaspoonful of arsenic and then add half a teaspoonful of strychnine and then just a pinch of cyanide. Mm. <laughs> should have quite a kick. Oh, yes, yes. As a matter of fact, one of our gentlemen found time to say, how delicious. Look, look, Andes, hmm? I, I don't know how to explain it to you, but you can't do things like this. It's against the law. It's not a nice thing to do. Well, I mean, well, this has developed into a very bad habit. Mortimer, we don't stop you from doing things you like to do. Why should you interfere with us? Because you... Listen, I've got to rush into town and cover that play. Do a lot of things. There's not a minute to spare. Are you sure you haven't time for dinner? I'm going to try a new recipe. Uh, thanks. I, I couldn't eat a thing. <laughs> This is it, Doctor. Yes, I remember this door. Even when I was a child, it always sounded like inner sanctum. Come in. Oh, Johnny, it is dark in here. That means the family still live here. The Brewsters were always sparing with lights. Is that so? Hey, who turns on the lights? I did. Who are you? 
Yes, what are you gentlemen doing here? Why, Aunt Abby, Aunt Martha, it's Jonathan. You get out of here. But I'm Jonathan, your nephew, Jonathan. Oh, no, you're not. You're nothing like Jonathan, so don't pretend you are. But I am. I'm Jonathan. And this is Dr. Einstein. Abby, his voice does sound like Jonathan's. But his face... Have you been in an accident? No. My face... Dr. Einstein is responsible for that. He changes people's faces. I ought now, to... easy, Johnny, easy. <laughs> Don't worry, ladies. The last five years, I give Johnny three new faces. I give him another one right away. You'd better, when my own family doesn't now, even... Johnny, I'm sorry. I saw that horror picture just before I operated, and I was a little drunk. But anyway, now you are home. Ladies, how often he tells me about Brooklyn, about his house, about his aunts that he loves so much. Oh, please, you, you, you must know him. S speak to him. Tell him so. Well, J Jonathan, it's been a long time since you ran away from us. Yes, where have you been all these years? Oh, England, South Africa, Australia, the last five years. Dr. Einstein and I have been in Chicago. Really? We were in Chicago for the World's Fair. We didn't like it. We found Chicago awfully warm. Yeah, it got too hot for us, too. <laughs> well, Jonathan, it was nice to see you again. I, I mean, if you're in a hurry to get somewhere... Not at and... all, Aunt Abby. But, uh, uh, Martha, uh, but... dear, Martha, we mustn't let soup boil over. Um, Jonathan, if you'll excuse us for a minute. Of course. Come along, Martha. Johnny, we have got to work fast. The police, the police have got pictures of your face. i got to find a place to operate. And we've got to find a place for Mr. Spinalzo, too. Don't waste any worry on that rat. But we can't leave a dead body in the rumble seat. Oh, oh, you shouldn't have killed him, Johnny. He was a nice fellow. He gives us a lift, and what happens? He said I looked like Boris Karloff. Oh. <laughs> Don't... Very, Johnny. As soon as I operate and change your face again... Wait a minute. I know just the place. You do? Look, if this family hasn't changed, and I'm sure it hasn't, I'll bet my grandfather's old laboratory is just the, just the way he left Oh, good. And when you've done with me, why, we can make a fortune here. In Brooklyn? Of course. Practically everybody in Brooklyn needs a new face. <laughs> but, Johnny, your aunt's... I don't think they want us here. Leave that to me, Doctor. I'll handle it. Why, this house will be our headquarters for years. Oh, that would be beautiful, Charlie. This nice, quiet house and those sweet old ladies. I love them already. I get the bags, yeah? Doctor, we must wait till we're invited. But you just said... We'll be invited. And if they say no? Doctor, two helpless old women. <laughs> Sit down and make yourself comfortable. Ah... <sighs> It's like comes true a beautiful dream. It's so nice and peaceful here. That's what makes this house so perfect for us. It's so peaceful. Charge! Charge! What? What? The what? 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 We didn't really invite you, Jonathan. You invited yourself. Well, it just shows you I feel at home already. I'm sure I'm going to like it here. Like it here? You you mean you're going to stay? Oh, hadn't I told you? Now, Jonathan, you needn't think you're going uh, to stay. Abby, uh, uh, the dinner dishes. Shouldn't we get started on them, dear? Huh? Oh, oh, yeah, oh, yes, 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 of course. Jonathan, we'll speak to you later. <laughs> Johnny! Johnny, just now that teddy takes me down the cellar. And what do you think I find? What? The Panama Canal. The Panama Canal. Uh, listen, listen. He digs a hole down there. Just the right size for Mr. Spinalzo. Say, that's an idea. What a joke of my aunt's to bury a body in their cellar. <laughs> but... How are we going to get him in? Get him in through those French windows. We can hide him in the window seat. The window seat? It's perfect for a corpse. Why, when I was a youngster, I used to hide there myself. Then, a little later on, when my aunts have gone to bed, we'll take him down and bury him. But, but, but suppose they come in here and find us. My dear doctor, you don't understand. My aunts are doing the dinner dishes. They'll be in the kitchen for quite some time. Oh, they will? Yes, they've always kept a very neat home. 
Shall we go? But, Abby, are you sure they've gone out? Yes. They're out there at their car. Besides, we've got to get Mr. Hoskins out of this window seat. <laughs> yes, poor dear. He can't be very comfortable. And when Mortimer gets back, he'll take care of Jonathan. There'll be an awful row. They've never liked each other. Mother, I will not invite Jonathan to Mr. Hoskins' services. Abby, dear, we better hurry. Yes, let's see if Teddy is still in the cellar. Teddy, are you down there in Panama? Who dares call the president by his first name? Mr. President, we've got another gentleman. Is he dead? A yellow fever victim. Teddy, I'm afraid you'll have to hurry. Ah, that's yeah. it, Doctor. Yeah. That's fine. See how nicely he fits? Just like this window seat was made to order. Now we'll go upstairs. When my aunts have gone to sleep, we'll come down and put him away. And after that... I know, Johnny, I know. I operate. <laughs> Everything seems quiet enough. They must be sleeping, I guess. Might as well have a little light down here. Yeah, that's better. Now, let me see. First, I've got to get Hoskins out of the window seat. It's not very pleasant, but it's got to be done. Come on, old man. I'm sorry to disturb you. <coughs> Another one! Mortimer! Darling, you're back. Just in time for the services. Aunt Abby, Aunt Martha... There's another body in the window seat. Look! Now, who can that be? <laughs> Why, it's a stranger. My goodness, how did he get in there? Now, wait a minute, you two. You can't get out of this. That's another one of your gentlemen. Mortimer, how can you say such a thing? That man's an imposter. But you admitted... <laughs> you admitted you put Mr. Hoskins in the window seat. Well... Yes, I, I did, but I... Well, this I... man couldn't have just got the idea from Mr. Hoskins. <laughs> By the way, where is Mr. Hoskins? Teddy took him down to Panama. Yes, he's down there waiting for the services. Oh, Abby, dear, we've always wanted to hold a double funeral. No, Martha, I will not read services over a total stranger. Stranger? <laughs> Aunt Abby, there are 12 men buried down there in the cellar. You admit you poisoned them. Now you try to tell me this one is a stranger? Well, of course. Darling, you don't think I'd stoop to telling a fib? The second act of the Lady Esther Screen Girl play will follow in a moment. And now, Lady Esther presents the second act of Arsenic and Old Lace, starring Eddie Albert and Boris Karloff with Verna Felton and Jane Morgan. Well, Mortimer thinks he's going crazy until his brother Jonathan walks in. That makes the answer fairly apparent, and Mortimer shifts right into high. He tells him he's going to call the police and show them the very dead Mr. Spitalzo. And it looks like his bluff is going to work when Dr. Einstein comes rushing in. Johnny! Johnny! Come along, Doctor. It seems that we are leaving. No, Johnny, wait. Just now that Teddy takes me down to Panama again. And guess what? What? Johnny, we stay. We got an ace in the hole. <laughs> Now, Jonathan discovers poor dead Mr. Hoskins, and that changes things all around again, especially since Mortimer has to leave to finish some very urgent business. And now, while they're awaiting Mortimer's return, the two old ladies are quite upset. Jonathan, will you please tell us what you plan doing with your Mr. Spinalzo? Going to bury him with your Mr. Hoskins, I suppose. Oh, no, you won't. We won't have any strangers buried in our cellar. And besides, the cellar's crowded already. Yes. There are 12 graves down there right now. 
12 graves. But you can see that leaves us very little room, and we're going to need it. You, you, you mean you two ladies have murdered all that? Murdered? Certainly not. It's one of our charities. Why, what we've been doing is a mercy. You've done that here in this house, and you've buried them down there? Johnny, we have been chasing all over the world. They stay right here at home and do just as good as you do. <laughs> what? You got 12? They got 12. I've got 13. Oh, Johnny, 12. 13. Oh, Johnny, you can't count the one in South Bend. He died of pneumonia. He wouldn't have got pneumonia if I hadn't shot him. No, Johnny, he don't count. He don't count. You, you got 12 and they got 12. The old ladies are just as good as you are. Oh, they are, are they? Well, that's easily taken care of. All I need is one more. That's all. Just one more. Well, here I am. Oh, please, young man, take my advice. Go away from this house. Go away now while Johnny is still busy in the cellar with Mr. Spinalzo. I'm sorry, Doctor. I'm expecting someone. Someone very important. Besides, I've still got to write my review. But I tell you, Johnny is in a bad mood, and when he's like this, he is a madman. Don't worry, I'll take care of Jonathan, too. Ah, Himmel, don't you got no sense? Uh, don't you learn nothing from those plays, you see? Are you kidding? You think people in plays act intelligently? You should have seen the one I had to cover tonight. There's a fellow in this play, knows he's in a house with murderers. He's even been warned. But does he get out? No, he stays there. Now, I ask you, Doctor, is that intelligent? You are asking me. He didn't even have sense enough to be on guard. For instance, the murderer invites him to sit down. Oh, you mean, won't you sit down? <laughs> Believe it or not, that was in there, too. So what happens? He sits down, just like this. What do you think they tie him with? What? The curtain cord. That's very convenient. A little too convenient. When are these playwrights going to use some imagination? So he sits there, the big dope. This fellow who's supposed to be bright, he sits there just like I'm sitting here letting murder walk up behind him, just waiting to be trussed up and gagged. You're quite right, my dear brother. That fellow wasn't very smart. Well, he seems to be gagged and tied quite well. All right, doctor. We go to work. Uh, please, Johnny, first I need a drink. Oh, there's some wine here. Oh, yes, the elderberry wine, by all means. I pour you one, too. Oh, how I need this. Please, doctor, your manners. Not without a toast. To my dear dead Judgment brother. Charge! Charge! Ah, oh, Kimmel! That idiot. He goes next. You hear me? He's next. No! Oh, no, Johnny, not Teddy. We'll get to him later. Come on, we've got to work fast. Hey, what is this? It's the cops. Listen, that Teddy's got to quit blowing his horn. We promised the neighbors. All right, officer. We'll speak to him. I better talk to him myself. Where's the lights? Ah, that's better. I'll go up to his room and I... Uh... Hey, ain't that Mr. Mortimer? Uh, yes, it is. What's he doing tied up like that? Well, well he... Uh, he was explaining the play he saw tonight. <laughs> that's what happened to the fellow in the play. No kidding? Well, I wouldn't want to interfere. Hey, you oh, Harry. Oh, hi, you brofy. How's the prowl car business? That kind of warm. Lieutenant Steven. Did he get you on the radio? Yeah, he says he got so many complaints from the neighbors, you'd think they dropped an atom bomb on Flatbush Avenue. He says we got to take Teddy and... Uh, uh, what's that guy trussed up like that? Oh, that's Mr. Mortimer. He's playing. Well, get him untied. He looks like he's choking. Oh, sure. Won't take me but a second. Officer, to... sir, perhaps you better let me... Hey, who is this guy? Uh, that's, that's my brother... And you'd better stick around because he... Don't listen to him, officer. He's dangerous. Huh? That's why we had to tie him up. He's the lowest kind of person in the whole world. A dramatic critic? <laughs> and my two aunts. Huh. You think they're sweet, charming old ladies, do you? Well, there are 13 bodies buried in their cellar. Listen, you be careful what you say about your aunts. They happen to be friends of ours. Hey, Brophy, can you imagine with a puss like his... Why, he looks just like Boris Carlos. Why, are you... Hey, wait a minute. Hey, oh, hey, Brophy, help me. Let go, Brophy. you. What's the idea? You hear me? I said, let go. Oh, there. Uh, to take care of him for a while. Uh, what was fighting him? Choking me 
like that. I don't know. When you said he looked like it... Hey, wait a minute. This guy is wanted. You sure? Sure. Don't you ever read true, detective? He escaped from an asylum. Well, well, that's the way he was described. He looked like Karloff. Is, is there a reward? Yeah, yeah. Help me lug him out to the car. But, but how about the bodies in the cellar? Bodies in the cellar? Ain't that enough to show you he's nuts? Hey, hey, what about the other one? You, you know who I mean, Mr. Mortimer. The doctor. Yeah, he must have walked out. Well, don't worry, we'll pick him up. Come on. Uh, Mr. Mortimer, you'll excuse us, huh? I, I mean, seeing as how it's a reward. Well, I understand. Uh, but you will take care of Teddy, though. Absolutely. Tonight. Aunt Martha, Aunt Abby, I know it's very late, but you see, Mr. Witherspoon came all the way over here. He's the superintendent of Happydale, you know. He is? How nice. Yes, and all the papers have been signed, and... He's going to take Teddy with him tonight. Really, Mr. Witherspoon? Well, that was my understanding. Mortimer, does Teddy know? Uh, not exactly. Uh, he thinks he's going on a safari to Africa. Abby, dear, we'll miss Teddy, won't we? We'll love him so. Oh, I've fixed all that too, Aunt Martha. You and Aunt Abby are going along just so you can be close to Teddy. Why, Mortimer, how thoughtful of you. Yes, isn't that nice? And Mortimer, you can have the house. The house? Of course, you'll need it if you're going to marry Elaine. Elaine? Holy Toledo, she must still be waiting. Excuse me, I've got to go and call her. <sighs> He's such a good boy, Mr. Witherspoon. Yes, yes, I'm sure. You know, uh, since we're all going away together, I, I think we ought to celebrate, have a party. I'm sorry, but I'm here in an official capacity. Oh, that's too bad. Tell me, does your family live at Happy Dale, too? I'm afraid I haven't any family. You're all alone. <laughs> oh, isn't that too bad? You know, Martha, if Mr. Witherspoon won't uh, let us give him a party, at least we might offer him a glass of wine. Of course, the elderberry wine. Elderberry wine? We make it ourselves. Well, uh, of course, at Happy Dale, our relationship will be much more formal. But here... Oh, we're very informal. Yes. Uh, go ahead, Martha. Uh, pour him a glass. On behalf of the Motion Picture Relief Fund, thank you, Boris Karloff, Eddie Albert, Jane Morgan, and Berna Felton for your delightful performances. Next week, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players will present Love Letters. It will star Loretta Young and Rex Harrison. Be sure to listen. Arsenic and Old Lace was produced and directed for Lady Esther by Bill Lawrence, adapted by Harry Cronman, and was presented through the courtesy of Warner Brothers, Producers of Deception, starring Betty Davis. Boris Karloff will soon be seen in the Cecil B. DeMille Paramount production, Unconquered. Eddie Albert can now be seen in the Republic picture, Rendezvous with Annie. Music on tonight's program was arranged and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. This is Truman Bradley speaking for Lady Esther. Thank you and good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>